Hi everyone, Sandman here. This video is brought to you by a donation from Mr. Anonymous. He didn't give me a topic, so I want to discuss a conversation I had in the comments section under my recent video called The Red Pill Movie. I was there filming the panel members, Vanessa Fisher, and when I posted my video she responded in the comments section, probably because I was talking about how bad the idea for women was to get involved in the men's rights movement. And here's what she has to say. Hi Sandman, so just to clarify, and this is a sincere question, what are you saying is basically that no matter what women do, they will always have malicious intent. If women aren't paying attention to the real importance of men's issues, then it is because they are selfish and self-absorbed, and don't care about men. And if women actually care and pay attention to men's issues, like Cassie J, or are actually willing to show up and discuss debate these issues, then they're also inherently doing it for their own benefit in infiltrating the men's movement with feminist thinking. I'm honestly trying to understand your logic. Basically, it seems like you're putting women in an impossible position. If they don't care about men's issues, or if they do, then they're always toxic. I guess that is the position one can choose to take. But it's also not unlike the position radical feminists put men in. Thanks for the much better footage in the panel discussion, by the way. I think I might have seen you in the front row. So that's what Vanessa has to say, and I responded by saying this, and I quote, Hi Vanessa, women have a subconscious bias for their own welfare, safety, and success first. Men also put women first too. That's where the idea of malicious intent comes from because of this perceived selfishness, which has its roots in the productive success of our species because we tend to prioritize the needs of women. Throughout history, the selfish woman survived, and the selfless woman died. This is biology, and it's not good or evil. It just is. Women paying attention to women's issues gain the attention of men, and the vast majority of women crave attention the way the vast majority of men crave sexual experiences. I have to generalize, but I also recognize there are exceptions to the rule. The problem is that men, when they fight for their rights with women around, will always choose to prioritize the success and the rights of the women first due to biology. We can't help it. It's not a conscious choice. You have to understand this issue from the perspective and motivation of the male mind to understand my logic. Men in the men's rights movement are in an impossible situation. Like all men, they crave female validation for their cause, but at the same time, female validation shuts down their ability to think rationally and clearly about their own self-interests. Feminists put certain types of behavioral expectations on men and try to enforce those using cultural Marxism and political correctness. MGTOW or men going their own way understand that we shouldn't and can't be putting behavioral expectations on women because biology will inevitably backfire in our faces. We try to be consciously aware of our unconscious desires to provide and protect and fight against those instincts. You're right about it being an impossible position because both sexes have their biological drives. When men care about women, we instinctively tend to sacrifice our own well-being, futures, and desires. When women say they care about men, you instinctively bring your own needs into the situation, even if it's done covertly. Even now, I recognize that I'm spending a lot more time responding to you than I would to any other man writing these same comments. I understand I'm doing that because you're young, attractive, and that's just part of my male drive. You work as a waitress in a strip club, so you see male nature on a daily basis. You see those poor souls that are there not because they want to be there, but instead because it's the only way they can receive female validation from an attractive woman. You're exploiting the male desire for female validation. But so does a female barista at Starbucks or a female cashier at the grocery store. The majority of men are desperate for female validation and attention, as well as approval, so when men's rights activists see women at their events, it makes them feel good about the cause. To be honest, I've never seen so many women before at an MRM event before. Considering that I've written so much, I might take this response and make it into a video. I appreciate the questions and getting me to think so deeply on this particular issue. I would say I would take the technological stance on this issue as well. I think technology has freed women sexually and financially, and I believe it's high time that the same thing happened for us men. I also enjoyed your video on your YouTube channel about having patrons at the strip club that you work at slap your ass. I used to work as a bingo runner and had old grandmothers grabbing my ass as well as other forms of sexual harassment, but I guess it's just a double standard. But I'm glad you mentioned female validation and aspects of men that are more primitive, lol. We don't want to be shamed as primitive, but that's what happens when you're a man. Unfortunately, both men and women stepped across that line a long time ago. Cheers, Sandman, unquote. So after I finished my response and sent it, she wrote more, and here's what Vanessa has to say, and I quote, Sandman, thanks very much for this long-considered response. 
I'd like to respond to a few things that stand out to me in your comments. The first thing that I always wanted to say is that I really have a hard time with these kinds of evolutionary biology arguments about how the sexes just are, and how it can't be changed that runs so much risk of self-fulfilling prophecies. I'm not against biology at all. I think there's a lot we can actually glean from the insight in biology, and much of that can be systematically pushed aside in the social construction bias and a lot of postmodern feminism. But I also worry that evolutionary biology starts to become its own ideology and religion, as far too many MRAs and MGTOWs, not unlike the way that social construction becomes the ideology and religion of many postmodern feminists. I actually considered doing a whole video on comparing the two sides, social constructionists versus just so biology arguments, and showing where I see the limitations of both when approaching gender. Of course, there are some trends and generalizations we can make from biology, but there's also so much conflicting research on things as simple as brain differences in men and women. Anyone who looks hard at the research has seen the problems with making just so statements about men or women in this regard. And even if I decide in this moment to grant you that all these biological arguments you make are 100% true, I don't buy that this means we actually have no way out. I believe in evolution. I do, of course, believe that we have to acknowledge our biological roots and our animal nature or primitive selves, both men and women, and that this is essential to not bypass realities that are hard to swallow and to not start constructing utopian ideas of society. But at the same time, I also believe that women or men, for that matter, are actually determined forever by our biology or even their evolutionary history. We are conscious beings with the capacity for self-reflection, consciousness, and a certain capacity for empathy and choice capacity. All these things for me make us distinct from being purely animals destined to be forever on autopilot. I'm not saying that it wouldn't be hard to change some ingrained patterns, but I don't think it's impossible. Regarding your points about men always putting women's needs first and women always putting selfishness first, I think we really need to pull that argument apart and I actually have to hear more about how you're actually constructing this argument. I understand the general comment that you're making, but I also think a lot of this is context dependent. There are many ways that both sexes had to sacrifice themselves to roles that they weren't free in historically. Both sexes had experienced oppressive roles or roles that limited their agency. I realize not all MGTOWs or most believe this. There are also many ways women feel they sacrifice their own agency in relationships with men, as in their roles as mothers. Also, I know there's an argument calculating that men always put women's needs first, or female favor, and that women favor other women over men. But I can tell you the study this is based on has a lot of nuance that isn't acknowledged by a lot of people. I can also tell you from personal experience that I know a shit ton of women who will happily throw other women under the bus for male attention and affection. Women can be just as vicious to other women as men can to men. A lot of this is context-dependent and circles around what the issue is at hand. A lot of this is also hard to talk about across the gender divide because as men and women, we often only have access to our own experiences. And it makes it easy to generalize about the motivations or internal experiences of the other sex. I think as a result, we often really misfire a lot of our understanding of each other, and we lose a genuine curiosity for each other. We also set up airtight self-reinforcing frameworks where the other gender really can't ever win, or be someone we could see collaboration being possible with. Anyways, there's more that can be said, but those are just some of my initial responses. Thank you for the engagement. Unquote. So there you have it, folks. Vanessa wants to say that evolutionary biology does not drive us to do the things that we do as much as we think it does. Here's my final response to her comments, and I quote, We are evolved like any other organism on this planet to survive and thrive in certain types of natural environments. The problem is our software, culture, and language is far more advanced than our bodies. As a man going his own way, I know that I can't change my nature. I know that when I get into a relationship, I become a bumbling buffoon and white knight for my partner as well as other women. So I choose to stay single. Yes, I have the choice to occasionally date and get it out of my system. I understand my biological drives, and that's why as a man I want lover androids and artificial wombs. Those will allow me to reproduce and have my sexual fulfillment too. But on the flip side, women want male attention, and if such technology comes out, women will be deprived of men to listen to them and give them the attention and resources they want. We want different things, so forced collaboration will fail given the choice to remain single. That's why we're seeing the birth rates collapse in Western countries right now. Unquote. At this point, Vanessa hasn't responded back to me, but I'll give you guys an update if she does. She believes that we currently have no way out of this quagmire, but there are possibilities. And that we're stuck in evolutionary biology arguments, and feminists have been trying hard to construct social narratives to escape biology. They believe that there are no real differences between men and women biologically, and that it's all social. 
I agree that some differences are social, but the vast majority of our drives and behaviors tend to be biological. Maybe 70% biological and 30% social. I'm not sure and probably have no way to know this for certain. But evolution is too slow of a process at this point. So I don't think it's a valid argument from Vanessa. I don't know what the answer is, perhaps genetically engineering women to be more similar to men. But then they wouldn't be women anymore. The arguments that feminists have put forth are rubbish. If you can't dazzle them with brilliance, then baffle them with bullshit. But getting back to what Vanessa was saying with regards to solutions, as men we need to solve our own problems and not be criticized and told that our thinking is a paradox. She wants to say that as a man I'm putting women into an impossible situation. Because if they help men, then they're bad, and if they don't help men, they're bad as well. If women give in to their biological imperatives, then they're bad, and if they fight their nature, they're bad as well. She wants to make my arguments look ridiculous, but we all know the answer to that. Only the individual man can help the individual man. Not individual woman, the female collective, or any other guy. We need to put ourselves out of this mess one guy at a time, and we need to cut the gynocentric cancer out of our hearts and out of our lives. Perhaps Vanessa is trying to create what I refer to as analysis paralysis, where we overthink things and therefore have zero actions to take in our lives. In the meantime, some of us get lonely and go to strip clubs, and she continues to have a job, as we sulk in our beer, staring at dimly lit 40-year-old breasts bouncing around a metal pole. But seriously, Vanessa, you saw me in the front row of the red pill screening, maybe we can discuss it over dinner sometime, and I'm sure we can find some romantic corner in your strip club. Don't worry, I can behave myself, as one of my ex-girlfriends used to run a strip club for her father. In this particular instant, Vanessa is not playing for the win. With regards to her arguments, she's playing for the draw, to confuse my rational mind. That's my theory. Anyways, that's all I've got to say for today. Thanks again, Mr. Anonymous, for your donation. Also, don't forget to check out the MGTOW mystery link and like this video. As for everyone else out there, please follow me on Twitter or like me on Facebook to get tomorrow's video today. Thanks for taking your daily dose of red pills. And remember, a red pill a day keeps the female MRAs away. So enjoy the rest of your day, and cheers.